So he talks to me. He's like, you know, I think you should forgive your father, you know, and all this other stuff, you know, what the Bible says and what this says. And I just remember cutting him off, saying, like, have you ever been physically abused by your parent? Like, now nah, I'm not talking about discipline. Like, they, they, you know, they discipline you, but I'm talking about beyond that. Like, and I, I was real honest. Like, have you ever been thrown through a wall by your dad? Have you ever been hung off a balcony by your dad? Have you ever had a, a beer bottle broken on your back by your dad? And he said no. And um, I got in real big trouble because I got so angry that I started cursing at church. And I was like, you know, so you have no right to come into my life and try to tell me how to live. John, welcome back to Delafe Testimonies. Thank you, thank um, you. We truly appreciate you being back. You've been highly requested <laughs> to be back since our last uh, testimony that we yeah. recorded. I want to just get right into it, man. If you could just share a little bit about yourself, share your testimony with us. In short, what people already have seen, um, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Um, so my name is John Martinez. I am married, father of three, um, and I love the Lord, love Jesus. Where the Lord took me out of is uh, a home that was very broken. More so, uh, I had an alcoholic father, um, super alcoholic. Uh, he was very physically abusive to, I. so I have uh, an older brother, so it's three, an older brother, myself, and my little sister. Uh, my older brother and I suffered um, abuse that kind of surpasses the norm. He, uh, for his own entertainment, he would make us fight in front of him. Got to the point where his friends started placing bets for us, kind of like a chicken fight, um, to see who would come out winning. And then eventually they brought their kids and they would bet so that we would have to fight against them um, forcefully. And if we didn't, there was... Um, there was serious abusive things that would happen to my brother and I. And that carried on for a good part of my childhood until I got off into late middle school, high school, started playing sports there, but got kicked off of the team for violence, got into gangs. And really the abuse led into me being uh, rebellious and I would fight everywhere or anyone that wanted to and um, got on drugs, uh, specifically on acid, and just go on trips. And in one of those trips, I just, my soul was longing for Jesus. I wanted him to come and rescue me, but I, I didn't believe that can happen for me um, until one day it did. I, I, I was transformed off of one bad trip, people would call it. I um, heard demons and I, and I had these thoughts of suicide and I so saw an angel come and hug me and say, like, this is God's son now. And everything really changed from there. Um, everything, grass was greener. Um, I wanted to look for God more and it just became a progressive thing. I wouldn't say it changed overnight, but it became it, it became a, an open door for me to try to start to walk through um, freedom. Yeah. And, and that's what we're going to talk about here, a little bit more of that of that process. Um, for anybody who didn't watch your testimony, um, we just encourage you to go check it out. The link will be in the description. It will also be on your screen. Go check out that full testimony to get his life before um, Jesus, which is very intense. Definitely some Definitely. parental advisory. And so I'm, I'm so glad that you said that, right? Because um, a, lot of, a lot of people had questions about, um, you know, your life after Jesus. Yeah. There was so much that happened in your life that um, it literally took up that entire time and we even had to do two sessions. So so let's just get to it. Like the main question that people had was about your father, yeah. obviously, because of the trauma that was involved between, you know, of, of him being the head of the family and how he decided to go about that role. Yeah. So can you talk to us about that? What did that healing process look like? And um what did you? What did the Lord had to do in your life to be able to heal that relationship? I'll start off by saying, just off the bat, my dad and I are, um, we have a very good relationship now, and that could only be um, by the Lord's grace. Honestly, um, it, it, it took a lot for me to want to um, even talk to him more more than a casual conversation of "Good morning, how are you? Good." But the Lord had to do a lot in me, and once I accepted the Lord, it was just kind of like a me thing. Like I, I wanted to go through all these steps of being set free from um, 
rage, from addiction. But the one thing that I couldn't let go or the one person who I couldn't forgive is my dad because I felt like he didn't deserve it. Like he didn't deserve me letting him off the leash just because I'm Christian or just because I believe in God. Um, so I never really talked to him after like I got saved. And um, once I started walking with Jesus, I just never really did. And if anybody would ask like, hey, like, how's your dad? Because, you know, the church knew. Uh, I would just say, yeah, you know, it'd be short. Like, he's okay. He's at home. He's this, he's that. Just keep it really short and bland. After a year after I got saved, my dad ends up getting saved. Mm. And, you know, he started he started walking through his sobriety. Oddly enough, he, he, and this is not recommended at all, he went through his own detox by himself. He didn't check himself in an institution. So we saw his pain he saw we saw all of that happen all i could think in my mind as he's shivering as he's like on the floor yelling in pain is like you deserve all of that you, you know like i was still saved i still love jesus but i had this anger towards this guy even though he said like i'm trying to walk for jesus i'm like okay and what does that have to do with me still crucifying him essentially and how old were you did. at this time um so this was i got saved at 17 so 17 18 that whole um that whole time frame and you know seeing him go through that um he would ask for help like ask me to bring him water stuff like that i would just walk away oh. um because to me he wasn't a father like i would see like on father's day there was this whole big thing that would always happen at our church um or they would have like families come and pray together and i would see whole families right i would see everybody moms dads and siblings and my mom would come and my dad would come and i'm just like i can't I can't pray because um, I didn't understand why. Like I couldn't, I couldn't feel like this was my family, even though everybody was still going to church. But in me, looking back now, in me, it, it's I didn't forgive him. I didn't give him that space. And my dad knew it. My dad knew it. Um, every car ride we would have, it would be the most silent, the most awkwardest car, uh, car ride ever. Like he would ask me, "How school? Good." Like I would never give him any any anything else. The only thing we could really connect on is music. Uh, he loves his salsa, his merengue, his cumbia. So that's what we would that's what we would just listen to, and that's how we would kill time. I I didn't take those moments as him trying. Uh, there was a time where he sat us all down at a dinner table. And he's like, you know, I haven't been the best father. Tell me what I could do to win you back as my kids. And I told him. I remember telling him to his face, like. I wish that you weren't my dad and that I had a new, I had somebody new who actually knew how to be a man. And I walked away and I was just like, I, I stormed out of the house and I was just like, whatever, like, who does he think he is? Like, after everything he did for me, like uh, he did to me, like he just wants to magically you know, switch it up. Like, hey, I'm Christian now. I'm saved. I'm, I can be your dad. Like, you, you can talk to me about anything and everything. And I'm just like, no, like you, you, you hurt me so much. Like I literally have scars and, um, somehow, some way a leader at church figured out that that conversation happened. They sat me down and they, they kind of just talked to me about it. And I asked them, you know, cause my dad was a very touchy subject. Anything that had to do with like you trying to speak to me about my dad, I would, I would still get so angry. Like my blood would boil instantly. So he talks to me, he's like, you know, I think you should forgive your father, you know, and all this other stuff, you know, what the Bible says and what this says. And I just remember cutting him off saying like, have you ever been physically abused by your parent? Like, no, nah, I'm not talking about discipline. Like they, they, you know, they discipline you, but I'm talking about beyond that. Like, and I, I was real honest, like, have you ever been thrown through a wall by your dad? Have you ever been hung off a balcony by your dad? Have you ever had a, a beer bottle broken on your back by your dad? And he said, no. And um, I got in real big trouble because I got so angry that I started cursing at church. And I was like, you know, so you have no right to come into my life and try to tell me how to live. And he's like, you know, but, I, but I'm just trying to, you know, look out for your spiritual well-being. And I was like, you know, forget it. And I walked out. As, as my father, like, was going through his own healing from himself, um, he started to come into our church more often. And once again, I hated when people would relate my father to me. And out of all my siblings, oddly enough, I look exactly like him. Well, I look closer to him. Um, and everybody would say, like, you look just like your dad. My dad is a jokester. When Once he was, like, 
uh, got fully sober. He was joking. He loved to serve. And everybody would say, like, you're just like him. And I, I couldn't bear that thought. I remember there was this one guy. He was he, he and I were really close friends. And um, I don't know how, like, rage just got over me that I pinned him up against the wall. And I was like, don't you ever compare me to that man ever again in your life. I was like, because he and I are completely different. And I will never, ever, ever be like him. I would just tolerate him. I would never consider him my dad. But little by little, the Lord started bringing people to ask me, how's your dad? How's this? How's that? How's this? Um, uh, until the the guy that actually allowed me to play music at church, his name is Eric. He'd be like, man, like, I know you don't like talking about your dad, but you have to take it as a blessing that he's still around. Because his dad, um, something happened with his dad, but his dad wasn't present. He's like, I don't have one. You have one. And he's actually trying. So maybe you should just give him a little bit of grace. And he and I, he had dealt with me a lot. Like he was the guy that really helped me answer all these questions about Jesus, about God, about how to walk and everything. So I was really honest with him. I was like, I don't feel like he deserves it. I don't, I, it's not in me to forgive him. And he's like, I mean, I, he's like, you know, I don't understand, but I can see where you're coming from. He's like, but don't you think that he deserves at least a chance? And I looked around and I was like, no. <laughs> I was like, no. Um, I was like, he had his chance when I was a little kid and he blew it. And he's like, well, he's saved now. And I was like, yeah, good for him. Like he's going to heaven. He's like, but you know, the Lord saved you and he gave you a second chance and he gave him a second chance. And he started preaching to me about family and unity and how bitterness and, and resentment can really hinder your spiritual life. I, I think I was over his house and I was like, you know, I got a so upset. I was like, I'll respect to you, but I'm going to walk home. Don't even bother taking me home. And it was like a five mile walk. And I just like stormed off. But all that was started playing in my head. Like maybe I should give him some grace that he's trying and he would try, like I'd be honest. Like he, um, I, I played football and and um, I, I did a lot of sports. And he would want to run with me. He would want to work out with me. But I never let him because I just felt like, like who are you? Why are you trying now? Like I'm, I'm a grown person now. So fast forward to um, like 19, 20, when I met my wife, we started to talk, my father and I. But then I realized that um, I still had this thing towards him. Cause my 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 wife, um, she comes from like a broken home too, um, and she was telling me like, "Why are you so mean to your dad?" And I never really shared with her my testimony, and I was like, "It's just a me and my dad thing." And eventually, you know, she got tired of that, and I started asking me, and I told her my testimony, and she said the same thing that this guy Eric said, like, "You have to be grateful that he's still here, and that he's." living for Jesus. It, what I told her, I was like, you don't understand. I can't look at this man and call him my dad with when he did everything that he did. You just don't understand. You've never been through it. That was my staple thing. Like you've never been through it. So you can't tell me how to how to stop thinking this way or, or stop the, the thoughts and the memories that I have. And she was just like, okay, she let it go. Fast forward a couple of years, we we um, we got pregnant with our firstborn, and the thought in my head all throughout the pregnancy is, I'm not going to be like my dad. I'm not going to be like my dad. I'm going to raise him right. I was still talking to my dad, but I would more tolerate our conversations. It would still be short, but I would still like, instead of, he would ask me like, how are you doing? Good. And there'd be like silence, and I'd be like, okay, fine. Like, how are you doing? How's work? You know, just kind of like conversations to show to my wife and everybody that I'm like trying to forgive him. What really, really came out was once my son was born and I would see how my dad would play with my son. He would tickle him. He would like make him laugh. He would feed him. And I got jealous. And I was like, where was this guy when I needed him, where where was this dad that loved, that nurtured? Where was where was this man? And it, we had a um, my brother had a dog, and she was very aggressive. She you know she was a she loved to play, so she would jump. And my dad shielded m my son at one point, and like got scratched on his back. And I was like, you, in, I stormed out, and my my wife saw us, so she followed me. I was like, he never did that for me. Mm -hmm. 
just jealousy. Like I never, never received any of that. And I remember just, um, I started crying and I was like, he, and that's the only thing I would say, like, he never did that for me. And my wife was just kind of consoling me and she's like, you know, but now you have an opportunity for him to do that. And I was like, no, like for what? Like I'm, I'm a grown person. Now. I'm, I'm married. I have a kid. Um, I was 21 turning 22 around that time frame, And I was like, for what? Like, I'm an adult now. What, what do I have? I don't need that anymore. Um, and she was like, no, I think you do. And I was like, no, I don't like, I don't, I don't need anything from him. He doesn't owe me anything. I don't owe him anything. Um, he's fine. He's living for Jesus. I'm living for Jesus. He's serving. That's fine. And she was like, no, I think you, you need to forgive him again. It was like, there's no need to, he's living his life. I'm living mine. And I remember going to, um, a service and they were talking about forgiveness. Of course, they're talking about forgiveness. And he was talking about how sometimes you need to forgive the person, not for them, not to let them off of the hook, but to let your own heart off of the hook. A lot of times unforgiveness will block our spiritual growth because we have resentment. We have all this, all this thing that is hindering us from there. And the enemy's using that as a, as a, kind of like a, a plaque, like you deserve to be angry. You deserve to to not forgive this person. You deserve, you know, everything. Uh, you deserve to be, to to feel entitled to, to not want to even like tolerate this person. I remember it was random. I went over uh, my parents' house, but I thought it was just my mom. Um, I took my son, my firstborn, and um, my mom had to leave. And it was just my dad and I, and I didn't know he was asleep. And that that sermon was just in my mind, but I felt Holy Spirit tell me like, you need to tell him you forgive him. And I was battling, and I was you know rubbing my knees. I didn't want to, but then um, the only thing that I heard in my head was, "You have grace. I've given him grace, and I've extended my grace to him." And he took my son, and you know he played with him. He hugged me. I hugged him, and um, out of nowhere it came out of me like. Dad, I forgive you. And he started crying. I've never seen this man shed a tear. The only two emotions that I've seen from him is anger and laughter. I've never seen him cry. And he cried. He wept like a baby. And he fell to his knees. I took my son and he's just like, I needed to hear that from you. He's like, I know I've hurt you. And he started confessing all these things. Um, but it was like really quick because... Um, you know, he's like, I know I didn't, I done a lot of things to you. I, I know I, I haven't been the best person. And, you know, we left it at that. And I was just like, it's okay. It's okay. Cause I couldn't, I couldn't understand this emotion. Yeah. And I was like, it's okay. It's okay. Like, don't worry. But so I cut him off, but part of me still wanted to hear everything. Right. Like his, his, his moment of repenting himself because it was so much for me. And I was like, no, 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 it's okay. Like, don't worry about it. It's okay. So, you know, we start. I started trying to forgive him um, and started having conversations with him and everything. Um, and it wasn't until like that moment happened that I was able to see him as a person, see him as a person that God saved and God redeemed. I started putting myself in the conversation, like in uncomfortable conversations for me. Um, what I mean by that is like, I started asking him, how's work? How are you feeling? Um, he's diabetic. So I was like, you know, do you need medicine? How are you feeling on this? Like just checking up on him and like honoring him as a person who has been saved by by Christ first and foremost, and then as my father. I started getting comfortable with calling him dad. Um, so it's like you know learning new things all while allowing Jesus to expose all these areas that I needed to heal from. So fast forward to like about I'm 26, so like about 24, 25. Uh, we were moving and, and I asked him for help and it was a long drive. He was driving and there was this awkward silence again because we ran out of things to say. My phone died, so there was no music. It was a red light and he sighs really deep and I'm just like, hello? And he touches me on my shoulder and I'm just like, okay, this is going to be deep. And he's like, you know, I really want you to forgive me. And I'm kind of looking at him like, what do you mean? Like I did. And he's like, no, no, no. He's like, I know everything that I did to you. He told me, I know I hurt you. 
He's like, I know you have scars on your body because of what I did. He said, I know that you went to sleep scared. He's like, I know that I wasn't a good father to you. He's like, and you may not understand it, but I didn't have a dad. My parents are Salvadorian, so there was a war that happened. And he had to flee the country when he was eight to Mexico without by himself. And he's like, I, I just want you to understand that I didn't have any type of guidance. And the only thing that I leaned on to was alcohol. He's like, and I know that poisoned my mind and poison and, and, and that spilled onto you. Like I hurt you. I tortured you. He's like, and I just asked for you to forgive me. There was a moment in my anger. And I had forgotten about it because sometimes with trauma, you just forget things and he brought it up. There was a moment that um, when I was, I think it was like 16, 17, before, right before I got saved, he, he hit me really bad. And I was like, this is enough. I'm going to take matters into my own hands. And I grabbed the bat in the middle of the night. He was asleep. And I was like, I'm, I'm going I'm to end it. Like, I don't care. I'm going to relieve myself from him. And I, I held the bat up. And just a, it was a metal bat, too. And just as I was getting ready to swing, I heard the Lord audibly for one of the first times. He said, stop, put the bat down, go to your room. He brought that up. He's like, I knew I hurt you when I saw that. He was awake. I thought he was asleep. He's like, you know, I didn't do anything because I knew I deserved it. He's like, I knew I deserved death. I saw it. He's like, I saw it. I saw you and I saw what you did. I saw you hold the bat up. He's like, but I deserved it. Because I didn't deserve you as my son. I didn't deserve anything. He's like, but you didn't. He's like, and I just, when you left the room, I just started crying. And, you know, I'm, you know, tears in my face too, as he's telling me this. And he's like, I just really want you to forgive me. And I know I don't earn the right to, for you to see me as your dad. He's like, but I thank you for trying. I thank you for trying. I thank you for really just holding conversations with me. He's like, because I thought I lost you as my son. And this had been years since like, at this point, we now had three kids. We went from one to three. And I was just like, you know what, dad? Like, I was like, I forgave you when I told you that one time, like years ago. I was like, but thank you for telling me, you know, your story. Because at this point, I didn't understand why he was so angry. I didn't understand why he was an alcoholic. And I started learning the power of addiction, how addiction doesn't only hurt the person, but it hurts those around you. And I started to understand why he was so angry, why he 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 couldn't love, because all he knew, and he started telling me about like everything that happened in in Mexico as he as he was uh as he was running away from a war, how he had to like fight to get money, to get food, to get a place to sleep, and you know not not excusing what he did, but it, it brought perspective. And through through that perspective, I was able to see all he knew was violence, you know, and, and how he took that out on us. And this is what a man is supposed to do. A man is not supposed to cry in his mind. A man is supposed to be tough. A man is um, supposed to be able to fight when ready. So I started to understand that and allowing Holy Spirit to speak to that space that I needed. I needed God and how I, how I just needed to understand him. Just how God understands us in our brokenness. And even though we're broken, he sees He sees that and he still chooses to forgive us. And that's one of the things um, I, I've, I heard him say is like, I forgave him and I know all his mess and I see all that. And um, I still chose to forgive him. From there on, um, we've been trying, you know, he acknowledged what he did. And um, I, I also told him like, you know, I, I didn't forgive you but I'm trying to. Um, but I was trying in our conversations that we would have. You know, I wouldn't say that we're laughs and giggles now, um, but we are talking and um, I can truly look at him in his eyes and give him a hug, give him a kiss. And I don't mind being compared to him now because who he is now is who he, isn't who he was. So right now, my dad is a person who loves to serve. If you go over his house, he'll you know, make sure you have water, make sure you have food. He'll make you laugh. And these are all attributes that I have, 
you know, that I love to, to just see people laugh. Um, I love to serve. I just love to, to just make sure people are comfortable. Uh, where before, like, because I had resentment in my heart and I didn't allow Jesus to, to deal with all that. I, I couldn't even be compared to him. Like, oh, you guys look alike triggered like immediately. But now like I tell people like, yeah, he and I look the most alike. So my dad and I, we, we, we have fun. We have a lot of fun. Once I allowed Holy Spirit to come in and really speak to that space, it was really beautiful. Mm. You and your brother shared some of those moments of, of, of trauma. Where's your relationship with him? Is he walking with the Lord? Can you tell us a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, so my brother and I, we've always been close because of what we went through. We've, we've always been attached to the hip. That still continues on today. We can talk about anything and everything. Um, we, um, there was a point where we couldn't talk about what we went through. It was just kind of like we had a messed up upbringing, um, but we made the most of what we have. He's not married. He's still single. Um, he went to college. He is not walking with the Lord at the moment. Um, but slowly but surely, he is acknowledging that Jesus is real. So for him, it's a different story. Like he can't believe Jesus is real because of everything that we went through. And we talk, we talk a little bit. We talk about what we went through now. And I tell him he's so lucky because as for me, in my mind, I can remember everything. For him, he can't really remember it. Wow. And I tell him like, you're so lucky that you don't. And he's just like, you know, I, I didn't choose my lifestyle. I just made the most of it, and this is where I am now. My sister, she and I, I've I've always been super protective over her. When she went to school and she had problems, I would always be the first one there to show up because I love to fight, so why not be there to protect her on a fight? But my sister is walking with, with the Lord. She went through her own bouts of um, not physical abuse, but she had more emotional abuse. So she went through uh, a time of like suicidal, like she, we had to take her into the hospital a couple of times. And this is all while like I'm married. So I'm out of the house. I left the house and all this started to, um, how much younger is she? She is five years younger than I am. So, um, from 20, she's 15. Um, so she was starting going through a lot of, a lot of, she finally had a space in her mind where the cap, she had no more cap. Mm. She couldn't stuff it down anymore. So she started going through her own phase of like um, letting all that emotion out, obviously in a negative way. But the Lord kind of healed her and restored her from all that. And now she's serving in church. I would say that we're all pretty close because of what we went through, my, especially my brother and I and my sister. She kind of just looks at us as like, kind of like second father, father figures. But I always been very cautious of my sister just because I didn't want anything, any physical abuse to spill on her. So, um, yeah, we're all, we're all, um, pretty close because of that. With your mom, could you talk to us about your relationship with her? Um, even as you became to surrender your life to Jesus and obviously not tell her testimony cause that is her testimony. Right. Um, but, but what have you seen as a son that, uh, the Lord had to do in her. Is she walking with Jesus? Is she not? What did, What is going on with you and her? Yeah, so my mom is walking with Jesus. Um, she never really stopped going to church um, and asking for, for like the Lord to help. Growing up, I was always very angry with her too because I felt like she didn't intervene enough. She didn't try to stop. She didn't try to leave. She didn't try, like... To me, in my mind, she never tried. Everything that my dad put us through would happen. We got sent to our rooms, and then my mom would show up after, all the time, right? Or after it was all said and done, my mom would come in and just kind of help clean us up or pray for us and then put um, sleep in our room. So I always felt like there was more she could have done. In school, they teach us, you know, the police and stuff. We could have been out of this situation, out of this predicament. And I talked to her one time, once I built up the courage to try to bring it up to her, she just said, like, just as you guys were abused, I was too. And, you know, there was only so much I could do. And there was so much fear 
put into her that even to pick up a phone was very scary for her to um, intervene. She did a couple times and she was hurt pretty bad. She was an immigrant into, into this country. So she thinks that, you know, she thought that my siblings and I were going to be separated and put in different foster care systems and bounce from home to home. So that, all those were fears for her. And ultimately, like she wanted my siblings and I and, and her to be together. But because of her status, she couldn't really work or she tried to, but she was scared that if she left for too long, that we would end up dead at the hand of my father. When she first told me that, like I kind of found it as like petty excuse. Um, like you could have went to an aunt's house. You could have went somewhere else, like a anywhere else. She did try it, but my dad would always, he would clean himself up for a moment or for a couple months and then she would come back because she really believed in family and um, she would really believed in like us being together. She had, she had a vision of us being together and having dinner at the table and all this. And um, so she bought into, she bought into it and, you know, the cycle would continue again. I struggled honestly to forgive her too, but it was easier because she was always the person that would come and just kind of give us a hug. She was the only person that would show us love. Um, so it was kind of easier to forgive her. But um, I couldn't really understand growing up why she didn't call CPS, why she didn't call the police, why she didn't just go off on her own. Because there's countless of people who do that. And, you know, their life turns out a completely different way. But it was all that. She was just so gripped by fear. She was so gripped by, you know, being in a foreign country and not feeling like she has a voice in this country. And honestly, nobody really supported her, whether it was um, her sisters or her brother. Nobody really supported her as like, you can stay here as long as you want, or I'm going to help you make the situation better. It was just kind of like temporary stay, and then from there you got to get out. So all that played a role into, into why she allowed everything to happen and why she stuck around for so long. So. Where are you at today with with your walk with the Lord? Could you give us an update in that? Obviously, you, you've mentioned you have three kids, you're married, uh, you've gone through some forgiveness, and, mm -hmm. and, and you're still working on these relationships. What is the Lord doing in your life today? So what the Lord's doing is um, he's, he's showing me what it's like to be a father. Obviously, I didn't um, have a good example. And like I said, when... Our firstborn, the thought of, I'm not going to be like my dad. Um, and that kind of bled into my second and a little bit of my third. And the Lord was just kind of like, let me father you. And from that place, let me teach you how to father. Because the, the Lord is gentle. So teaching me how to be gentle, teaching me how to, how to meet my kids where they are, whether they're tantruming, whether they're having fun, like in the good and the bad, being able to meet them where they are. Because that's what he did with me you know, dealing with still moments of anger, because that's what I meant. Like it's, it's been, it's been a process of letting go of that resentment and anger, letting go of that little me that's still so angry. There's moments where it, it would come out and um, Holy Spirit would just come and say like, let me heal that. You see that that's anger. Let me heal that. Um, and just really surrendering because the way that I see trauma is like trauma is like this big thing, but then it bleeds into other areas of your life. You know, the the Lord is really working beautifully through my kids and through um through my wife. Just my walk with the Lord has been been beautiful because it's it's been a beautiful surrender, let me put it that way. As I'm leaning more towards Christ, I'm just surrendering things that just all this baggage that has been coming up for 17 years of my life and just really allowing the Lord to show me how to be a father as he's fathering me, showing me how to be a lover as he's loving me, showing me to follow him as, as he's pursuing me constantly and daily and just extending his grace over towards me. I really take that and show it out to everybody at church, showing, showing it as I serve meeting people where they are, whether they're new, whether they've been here a thousand times, meeting them where they are, extending that grace. Because um, 
I, I, I look at my wife and I'm like, I wasn't supposed to make it. There were so many times where, uh, whether it was through fighting or whatever, like I, I could have lost my life, but there was grace for me to live this long, have a kid, have families and be able to say Jesus did it all. I'm like, how can I not extend that level of love and grace to somebody else and say like, hey, I don't know what you're going through, but I can tell you that Jesus has a plan for you. And it may not look right right now, but let's just... Take it one step at a time. Yeah. John, can you speak to the people who are dealing with unforgiveness? For anybody who's watching right now, who's having a hard time to forgive someone, mm -hmm. um, whatever that situation may be, whoever that person may be, what can you tell that person who's watching your testimony right now? Yeah. I would say I understand you. Truly, truly, I understand that you know, you have every right to be angry. You have every right to be upset. You have every right to want to hold this person in this place that they don't deserve it. But like the person told me, like forgiveness is not to let the other person off the hook, but is to let yourself off the hook, off of off of that anger that you feel, off of off of that that resentment that doesn't allow you to move forward. And one thing that I'd noticed in my walk with Jesus is that resentment and anger and bitterness will harm you health-wise, will, will bring up depression, will bring up anxiety, will bring up moments of rage. I understand that they deserve to not be forgiven, but you deserve freedom from your bitterness. You deserve freedom from your anger. You deserve uh, freedom from, from everything that's going in your mind when you think of not forgiving that person. And just give it to the Lord. Just give it to the Lord and allow the Lord to come in that place and say, the way I see it is like the Lord come into that place is saying like, hey, let me take that. Let me take that. And as I'm taking that, let me heal you from this. So I would just say, just, I understand but um, for you, forgive that person for you. Any last words, John, to anybody who's watching your testimony right now? For anybody who's going through um, any sort of trauma, any sort of pain from or de just dealing with their past, I understand it's not easy to open up to people. I understand it's not easy to trust people. But one thing I can tell you is as you talk about it, it gets easier and easier to just feel free from it, like weight is being lifted. It gets easier to know that, hey, you are a survivor, first and foremost. If you're watching this and, you, and you've and you been through trauma or been through any type of trauma, you're a survivor. You're a survivor. You made it. And the other thing, if you don't know G Jesus, I would definitely tell you, Jesus can definitely heal those scars. And I have scars on my body and I look at them and I'm just saying, instead of saying like, oh my God, this this happened, this happened, but it's just like, wow, Jesus, you set me free and you freed me from that. To my brothers and sisters, I see you and I, I'm sorry for what you went through, but there's also a God there who's seeing you, who wants to, to heal those scars and wants to talk to your trauma and saying that you made it. And he wants to use your story to help other people.